I was born in a military family. My father was a high-ranking officer of the Soviet Army General Staff, uh, Inspector of Land Forces, uh, stationed outside of USSR in every quote-unquote brotherly country or liberated country of the world. Uh, I graduated from Oriental Studies Institute affiliated to Moscow State University in 1963. I started working with Novosti Press Agency, the biggest propaganda and ideological subversion organization of USSR, which is directly under KGB. Ostensibly, it's a, it's a public news agency. Novosti in Russian language means news, but there are no news. There. It's mainly propaganda. Uh, my first job was a translator with Economical Aid Group in India. We were building refineries and, and other industrial projects in public sector, socialist sector of India. My last job was press officer of the Soviet Embassy in New Delhi. I defected in 1970, uh, came, landed in Canada, worked for several years as a producer of um, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, overseas service in, in Russian language, similar to Voice of America. Then I was teaching at uh, University of Toronto Political Science Department, uh, McGill University Slavic Studies, and School of Journalism Ottawa, in, uh, Carleton University in Ottawa. Uh, last year I uh, joined a small Russian language publishing house here in Los Angeles, and now I'm a political analyst for weekly Panorama newspaper. Uh, Lumumba University language instruction was my so-called extracurricular activity, uh, which is usually given to Soviet young communists as a non-paid job to prove loyalty to the party. I was instructing students from Asia, Latin America and Africa before they entered at an ideological indoctrination uh, uh, class. Uh, it was mainly uh, Russian language instruction, after which the students usually join two-year or three-year extensive course in Marxist-Leninist ideo ideological indoctrination, plus their own sub uh, subjects of, of their choice, uh, medicine, physics, uh, chemistry, whatever. Uh, if, they, if after uh, five or six years studying, they they are uh, proven to be, well, flexible, loyal, uh, cynical enough to follow the Soviet foreign policy. They are being transferred to a KGB school for, t for, the, uh, for a period of two years, after which they are being dispatched back to their native countries and become so-called sleepers, uh, uh, the word from originated from sleeping. For several years they sleep in their own countries doing nothing. Sometimes they are pursuing their own careers, become lawyers, doctors, uh, teachers, um, taxi drivers, barbers, and they spring into action after many years of destabilization of their own countries as Soviet agents. Therefore, all of a sudden you discover uh, well-established lawyers in, in a country like Nicaragua, who are, for some strange reason are uh, bitterly against quote-unquote American imperialism and idealistically for Soviet uh, Marxist-Leninist imperialism. Uh, I joined Novosti Press Agency uh, before I graduated from the Oriental Studies Institute where I studied Hindi and Urdu, two languages of Indian subcontinent. Urdu is the language of Pakistan and Hindi is the language of India. The journalistic part of my training was ordinary journalism, mass media, uh, uh, communication theories and, and studies. Together with that, we had a very extensive training in uh, military, civil defense, intelligence, and ideological subversion. So even before I graduated, I started working with Novosti Press Agency, first as a translator, interpreter, and guide with foreign delegations who were invited to USSR and who were shown all the beauties of socialism and dispatched back to their countries to explain to, uh, to their uh, uh, people how beautiful is socialism. Uh, my role was directly linked with KGB activities of, of brainwashing and psychological assessment of these guests. If they showed any sign of flexibility, which means uh, they showed that they were recruitable, uh, I passed them over to professional KGB recruiters and from there on they were actively being involved in ideological subversion and propaganda, both in USSR and in their own countries.
well, decision, of, of course, was very painful and, and difficult. But on the other hand, I didn't have any illusions or allusions about the Soviet system and, and communist or socialist system. It's the most rotten and unworking system in the world. Uh, some people call it state capitalism, socialism, centralized planning, whatever. It doesn't really matter what kind of name you attach to the system. Basically, if you are a religious person, it's a devilish satan satanistic system which appeals only to the most primitive, negative side of human nature. Uh, it, the, the basis of that system is denial of private property, human dignity, and, and personal responsibility, and of course, any religion, uh, religious affiliation of a human being to God as a supreme being. Uh, my dissatisfaction, disillusionment, if you, if you can call it, because I never was illusioned uh, 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 with, this, with the communism, started as early as um, age, from age six, I guess. Uh, the first shock uh, was after the Second World War, uh, when most of the children of my age understood that United States is the friend uh, with whom together uh, Soviet people defeated Nazism, German fascism, all of a sudden turned into an enemy. Uh, and all of a sudden the propaganda turned 180 degrees around and we were brainwashed in the spirit of hatred to everything which is American. But how could you explain to a child of six years old who owes his survival to American spam condensed milk, egg powder, and things which you probably people never remember because nobody eats them these days. Spam meat, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> How can you explain to them that these delicious things came from an enemy who wants to subvert and destroy us? It's impossible because the child remembers when he was hungry, he was eating spam and, and drinking condensed American uh, milk with the American eagle on the, on the label. So, all the efforts of the Soviet propaganda to convince me that America is bad was futile, naturally. That was the first shock. The second was this 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party when Khrushchev revealed the atrocities of Stalin terrorism and um, murder, systematic murder of millions of innocent people. That was another greatest shock. Uh, and the third shock, of course, when I was already grown up, uh, a student, invasion into Czechoslovakia in 1968. That was the last point. Uh, and when I was in India, acting as a Soviet uh, official, a Soviet diplomat, I understood that sooner or later I have to defect and to explain what exactly I was doing in India. I fell in love with that country because um, at that time, this country didn't do any harm to any neighbors, least of all to the Soviet Union. And yet, we did so much harm to that country that I decided to defect and explain it. First to Indians, then to American uh, politicians, intelligence communities, and media. Unfortunately, I didn't have much success because my stories were treated with a great skepticism. I was called paranoid, McCarthyist, fascist, Cold War maniac, and other names which I don't want to mention here. And um, it took me quite a number of years to understand that I'm talking to people who are trying to prevent average American from knowing the truth about communism. The basic methods are not that much different from activities of any public relation officer from any big company, say Coca-Cola, I bet. They have their own department of, person, of public relations and press relations. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose is different. If Coca-Cola wants to make profit and to sell more Coca-Cola to nations of the world, the Soviet Union, the ultimate purpose of the Soviet system is not to sell anything, least of all ideology, is to destroy the civilization on which uh, the affluence and freedom based and replace it with a system of total control over life of human beings, the system of total exploitation. That's the, the ultimate purpose. Can, uh, my specific measures which, which I was forced to do, unwillingly of course, but I had to do them just to promote myself further and further, is uh, bribery, corruption, uh, befriending politicians, members of parliament, influential uh, scholars, uh, members of civil service, businessmen. In other words, anyone who has any 
um, anything to do with shaping of public opinion in the interests of the Soviet foreign policy. Uh, that would include a long process which sometimes is unnoticeable to an average person. It's a long-term process which is called so, uh, uh, ideological subversion. It's unnoticeable as movement of a small hand of a clock. You know it's going around, but even if you watch it in intensely, you, you don't see the movement. The eventual result is uh, befriending these people and trying to get them involved in, in the activity in the interests of the Soviet foreign policy. The immediate impulse when I learned that the Soviet Embassy, Department of Research and Counter Propaganda, of which I was a deputy chief, is engaged neither in research nor in counter propaganda. It is a department which is compiling information of private nature on individuals divided in two groups, good boys and bad boys. The sympathetic people were promoted in media and, and public life. Uh, the people who were opposed to the Soviet foreign policy were blackwashed, blackmailed, and, and, and destroyed, first morally and, and sometimes physically too. Uh, understanding of what I was doing came to me when I, when I looked through a press release of United States Information Service describing an incident in a South Vietnamese city of Hue, captured by communists from Hanoi for, for 48 hours. Then it was recaptured by United States and South, South Vietnamese armies. And to their horror, they discovered that within two nights, the communists could manage to round up more than 15,000 people and execute them. Uh, most of these people were either sympathetic to United States or to the Western culture, or directly involved uh, in, in activities uh, uh, supporting United States presence in South Vietnam, agents of CIA naturally, even barbers because they know too much. They were executed and United States intelligence couldn't figure out how could they possibly do it in such short period of time. Later on they discovered, uh, they found out from several defectors that long before communists occupied that city, uh, there was an extensive omnipresent network of informers who knew exactly the addresses, the names, the whereabouts of each individual who was later executed. When I turned to my own files, I discovered that basically that information exists in my department. So it doesn't take much intelligence to understand what I was doing in India. I was compiling information. Comes revolution, these people would be executed. Indirectly, I was involved in, in, a, in a criminal activity, in, in mass murder. I decided to defect and explain it to Americans, and the uh, response I already described, I was called a paranoid. But I decided to defect and try nevertheless. This is another long story. It's virtually impossible to defect in India simply because Indian government under pressure from the Soviet government, if you can call them government, I don't call them government, I call them junta. Uh, they adopted a law as early as, as, as in 61 or 62, after, after Stalin's daughter defection especially. That law states that no embassy, no, no foreign uh, uh, legation on the territory of Indian Republic has a right to extend political asylum to any defector from any country, which is very it's, it's a masterpiece of hypocrisy. No other defector but a Soviet one needs a political asylum. <laughs> uh, if you are a Canadian or American, if you want to be nasty to your own government, the maximum you can do is just to pick up a phone and uh, make a dirty phone call to your ambassador. <laughs> Buy yourself a ticket and get lost. <laughs> what, what happens to a Soviet defector in, under that law? If I knock a door of, of United States Embassy, by that law, the American diplomats have to turn me back to the Indian police, and the Indian police takes me back directly back to the Soviet embassy. And that's the end of, of my uh, defection. So knowing that perfectly well, and having contacts both with Indian police and American uh, media corps, I, I understood that the only way for me was to disappear for a while. And the best way I discovered was to mix with a group of hippies. Mind you, that, that was the time <laughs> I, 
I was 13 years younger, so I looked slightly different, of course. <laughs> uh, I studied so-called counterculture in India. Uh, sometimes uh, good, sincere young people who wanted to study Oriental mysticism and culture and religion but most of them were simply easygoing individuals who were delighted with exotic, exotic life and, and um, the easiness with which they can purchase hashish and, and other drugs in India. And sometimes they traveled Indian subcontinent without any identification papers. So the best way to, to uh, escape detection was to mix with the group of hippies and travel in India uh, until the campaign in the media and, and in the police, uh, the police search will subside. All the newspapers in India carried my picture and uh, announcement of the police uh, that anyone coming forward with information about my whereabouts would receive 5,000 or 2,000 rupees. Knowing that perfectly well, I just walked in there barefoot with beads and blue jeans, smoking hush and um, enjoying life until I found sympathetic journalists who smuggled me from India to Greece, mind you, that was a military dictatorship at that time. Then only I approached uh, American CIA and they helped me to uh, land in Canada as a legit uh, ordinary uh, immigrant. So now I'm a Canadian citizen, as you can see from my patriotic <laughs> type. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Canada is a kind of middle of the, way, uh, of the road country where uh, there are so many various ethnic groups that another uh, strange character who speaks both Russian and, and English and two Oriental languages, did, did, I, I, I didn't have any problem uh, fitting into academic circles and first being just a student at the University of Toronto and later a producer with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I think it was successful, and until and unless the, there will be follow-up to that uh, movie, uh, it will remain as as a as an open wound in in the United States as a scare tactic. Uh, which in this particular case, I'm not sure whether KGB paid for production of that movie or not. But it's totally irrelevant. What is the most important, unless after seeing the tragic sequences of, of the uh, uh, nuclear attack, uh, American population is not explained what to do about it. If you still stop at that and l let it be, obviously, th this is the scare tactic, this is the greatest harm done to United States by, by Americans, by American filmmaker. I bet Andropov and all his disinformation uh, system could not, could not possibly do that much harm to the United States. When, when you see something obviously sponsored by the Soviets, uh, you understand, well, this is propaganda. You may or may not agree with this, depending on your background and, uh, and, and intelligence and education. But here, it's a subtle approach, uh, playing on the most sensitive strings of your soul, appealing to, to the most basic instincts of, of, of human nature, survival. But there, there are no answers. How to survive? Well, obviously, disarmament is not the answer. Uh, simply because some people naively expect Andropov to blush uh, out of shame and reduce the number of warheads. Uh, it doesn't happen this way. This, we are facing unresponsive, irresponsible group of people for whom uh, nuclear war it's not a theory, it's a practice, and the, the military strategy of the Soviet Union is designed to, to do nuclear war and to survive, and possibly to win. I, I, was, I started my military training when I was six or seven years old, when I, when I entered secondary school. And I graduated in 63 after almost 15 years of continuous training as a junior lieutenant of reserve of the Soviet army. And uh, psychologically, every Soviet citizen is well prepared for, for, for war, nuclear war. And uh, technically, he is equipped with facilities and the knowledge how to use it in case of war or, or natural disaster, doesn't matter. Survival tactics and survival um, methods are taught 
extensively in, in various manners. They, they, they are exposed to documentary movies about nuclear war. They know the, the technical data of, of radiation or, or contamination of, of air and, and land. They know the organizational patterns of, of civil defense to such an extent that even if there is no nuclear attack, even if there is conventional uh, warfare, each individual at, at a certain time knows exactly where to go, what to do, where is the shelter, uh, whom to call by telephone, uh, which is not the case, unfortunately, in the United States. I think if, if a bomb, ordinary bomb, bomb, maybe a sting bomb is dropped in the middle of Los Angeles, most of the people will not die of uh, atomic radiation. They will die of panic. They will, they will run. And uh, the traffic jams and, 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 and the panic will kill more people than, than any, anything else. And where do they go? Is, is, is there any literature about how to protect an individual? Is the medical first aid treatment? It, it's not taught to, to, to kids in the American colleges, unfortunately. For example, there's obvious uh, tension in the world. Uh, t television newscasts um, inform American family about happenings in, in uh, East and West Germany. And only at the last moment they decide to bring the canned food down to the basement. <laughs> it's a sheer idiocy. Why not to have them in the basement at, the, at peacetime? Uh, number two, there's, there's a very realistic picture of what happens uh, when the first nuclear bomb strikes uh, a big city, Kansas City, I think. And people still, uh, a, a big panoramic uh, picture shows almost an ant hill when you know, people are disoriented totally. That would produce love in Russia, because unlike that, Soviets know exactly what to do. There will well, be much less panic, if, if, if at all. Uh, I, I know about infiltration of KGB into peace movement probably as much as an average uh, American who reads newspapers uh, systematically. But uh, I'm obviously, I, I'm aware that the World Peace Council is, is a front organization of, of the KGB. Ramesh Chandra I know personally, both in India and USSR. I work, worked with delegations of, of uh, various peaceniks who came to the World Congress of, 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 of Peace Council in Moscow. I think it was in 1961 or 62. Yeah, it was before Cuban crisis. And uh, at that time, they struck me as, as people who are pathologically unable to see the truth, uh, not to talk about the, the military aspects. When I, when, as a translator and, and a guide, I used to take them to places in Moscow which are not supposed to be for foreigners' eyes. Uh, they didn't want to see it. Uh, they had their preconceived ideas. They, they were suffering fr from self-importance. They thought it's, it's a great honor to sit in the Kremlin, in the palace of, of Congresses, next to, a, next to a debil from Kremlin, and uh, you know talk about peace as if uh, that person from Politburo means anything in, in peace movement. Self-delusion is, is the most predominant phenomenon among these people. Ramesh Chandra is, is a very shrewd politician who takes advantage of naive, misguided, idealistically minded, sometimes sincere people. Uh, but he is, I, I, I would, my impression is that he's totally sold himself to the Soviets. He receives his payments or royalties or whatever you can call it in the form of prizes. Of course, it's very embarrassing if you, if you, if you approach a person of his caliber with money, with cash, and say, here, Comrade Ramesh Chandra, there's a money for your propaganda uh, in the interests of the Soviet Union. It's very impolite. So instead, the Soviet Union creates artificial international bodies such as Jawaharlal Nehru Peace Committee, which consists of various progressive leaders, writers. Uh, sometimes they're, they're known figures, and uh, philosophers, educationalists. Uh, sometimes they probably feel that if there's no other possibility to express the de desire for peace, 
at least there is some legitimate overt activity where they can express themselves. That's okay. And they think they are too smart not to see that uh, part of it is Soviet propaganda. They think, okay, we are smart. We are not going to allow them to use us for propaganda purposes. This is wishful thinking. Because after five or six visits, visits to USSR, everything is paid by the Soviet uh, government. After spending several vacations on a Black Sea coast in luxurious atmosphere with two or three nice girls, interpreters, lots of vodka and caviar, books published, rapid books which nobody reads in the United States, all of a sudden published in millions of copies in USSR in various languages that tickles their ego. They think they are some, somebody's all of a sudden. It's difficult to resist the temptation. Ramesh Chandra is exactly that type of personality. He was approached at, at, at a very early stage, uh, and uh, uh, he didn't have willpower and moral principles to resist the temptation, to resist the approach. And by now, he's, he's just a pawn in the game high-ranking pawn, and um, uh, if he is dis dismissed or dies natural death, there will be another the, the line of people who would like to take his place. Yes, KGB takes very active part in the, in the peace movement, uh, and if these people were sincere as they say they are, they would start demonstrating in Kremlin, or I mean in Red Square, not in Washington, D.C., or in, in, in the Central Park in New York or in Los Angeles. But they don't have courage, they don't have guts to go to Russia and protest against the nuclear armament of the Soviet Union. Therefore, I agree that they are misguided, but I think they are cowards. They are unprincipled, dishonest people. And there's no justification that they are misguided or poorly informed. It's their fault that they are poorly informed. There's enough information there's enough possibility. In case of United States citizens, there's enough freedom to do what their consciousness should tell them to do. Go to Russia and protest against armament. It doesn't take much courage to, 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 to take part in demonstration in Los Angeles. But if you're really genuinely concerned about peace, tell it to Brezhnev, tell it to Andropov. And we'll see how courage, courageous and sincere you are. They don't do it. Well, the greatest strength, I think, is, is uh, uh, the, the basic principle of American democracy, common sense, and the, uh, the value of, of, of the principles of private property and, and, and respect to human dignity and, and indivi individual rights. The weakness is the permissiveness and lack of moral stamina, which if you are a religious person, could be, could be interpreted as probably alienation from religion, alienation from God. Thinking too much in materialistic terms, thinking in short span of time for pragmatic advantages, disregarding the perspective of civilization. Some philosopher, I forget his name, I'm, I was a bad student in Moscow, said that the level of civilization is in direct proportion to the time span that human being thinks in, in future, for future. The least civilized people live today, this minute. The more civilized nations think about tomorrow, 10 years from now, 100 years from now. Well, this is one of the definitions of... Unfortunately, Americans are made to think in shorter and shorter time span terms. This is the greatest weakness. So therefore, enjoy life and make love, not war. I, I think that willpower and revitalization of traditional moral values and principles is the most desirable thing now, today, the, the sooner the better. The things that the principles and values on which the affluence and success of American civilization depends and, and based upon should be immediately civil, uh, uh, revitalized and brought back to school programs, 
to media and, let's face it, propaganda. I'm not afraid of this word, unlike the left liberal journalists who think, oh, well, it's propaganda. I don't see anything wrong in propagating the basic moral principles and values on which America is built. Willpower, faith, unshakable faith that this country, this civilization is right and the enemy is wrong. No amount or no number of nuclear warheads and, and no size of the army will, will help United States to survive, whether there's nuclear war or conventional warfare. Vietnam proved very clearly that with all the technology, with all the supersonic bombers and napalm and whatnot, electronic gadgets and, and cold beer and Coca-Cola, you cannot defeat an enemy unless you are fighting and have faith in the righteousness of your fight. So that's the most urgent thing, I think. Wake up and, and, and convince yourself that you are on the right side. There should not be no neutralism or object, objectivity. Or Objectivity is good when you are discussing philosophical concepts. In today's world, if you are neutral, you are already an enemy of your own country. You have to actively take part of your country, your side. One of the reasons of my defection is that I took side. I was, I was decided to take part, to take choice, to make my own personal choice. For some strange reason today, it's very fashionable. It's considered to be an intellectual chic not to take sides. Academic media, mass, uh, uh, academic circles, uh, Hollywood stars, uh, politicians, they think it's very fashionable, it's intellectual to be non-allied, non-committed, uh, neutral. It's, it's, it's not intellectual, it's suicidal. <laughs> <laughs> suicidal. Subversion is the term, if, if you look in a, in a dictionary or criminal code to that matter, usually is, ex is explained as a part of activity to destroy things like uh, religion, government, system, political, eco economical system of a country. And usually it's linked to espionage and such romantic things as blowing up bridges, sidetracking trains, um, clock and dagger activity in Hollywood style. Uh, when what I'm going to talk about now has absolutely nothing to do with the cliché of espionage or KGB activity of collecting information. So the greatest mistake or mis mis misconception, I think, is that uh, whenever we are talking about KGB for some strange reason, uh, starting from Hollywood movie makers to professors of political science and quote-unquote experts on, on Soviet affairs or Kremlinologists as they call themselves. They think that the most desirable thing for Andropov and the whole KGB is to steal blueprints of some supersonic jet, bring it back to Soviet Union and sell it to the Soviet military industrial complex. It's only partly true. If, if, if we take <clears throat> the whole time, money, and manpower that the Soviet Union and KGB in particular spends outside of USSR border, we will discover, of course there are no official statistics unlike with CIA or FBI, that the espionage as such occupies only 10 to 15 percent of money, time, and manpower. 15 percent of the activity of KGB. The rest, 85 percent, is always subversion. And unlike a dictionary of English, Oxford Dictionary, subversion in Soviet terminology means always a destructive, aggressive activity aimed to destroy the country, nation, or geographical area of your enemy. 
So there's no romantics in there, absolutely. No blowing up bridges, no microfilms in Coca-Cola cans, nothing of that <laughs> sort. No James Bond nonsense. It's most of the, this activity is overt, legitimate, and easily observable if you give yourself time and trouble to observe it. But according to the law and, and law enforcement systems of the Western civilization, it's not a crime. Exactly because of misconception, manipulation of terms. We think that subverter is a person who is going to blow up our beautiful bridges. No. Subverter is a student who comes for exchange, a diplomat, an actor, an artist, a journalist like myself was 10 years ago. Now, subversion <clears throat> is an activity which is a two-way traffic. You cannot subvert an enemy which doesn't want to be subverted. If you know history of Japan, for example, before the 20th century, Japan was a closed society. The moment a foreign boat comes to the shores of Japan, the Imperial Japanese Army politely tell them to get lost. <laughs> and if American salesman comes to the shore of Japan, let's say 60 or 70 years from now back, and says, oh, I have a very beautiful vacuum cleaner for you, you know, with the good financing, he says, please leave us, we don't need your vacuum cleaner. If they don't leave, they shoot them to preserve their culture, ideology, traditions, values intact. You were not able to subvert Japan. You cannot subvert Soviet Union because the borders are closed. The media is censored by the government. The population is controlled by the KGB and internal police. With all the beautiful, glossy pictures of Time magazine and Magazine America, which is published by, by the uh, American embassy in Moscow, you cannot subvert Soviet citizens because the magazine never reaches Soviet citizens. It's collected from the newsstands and thrown to garbage can. Subversion can be only successful when the Initiator, the actor, the, act, the agent of subversion has a responsive target. It's a two-way traffic. United States is a receptive target of subversion. There is no response similar to that one from United States to the Soviet Union. It stops halfway somewhere. It never reaches here. The theory of subversion goes all the way back 2,500 years ago. The first human being who formulated the tactics of subversion was a Chinese philosopher by the name of Sun Tzu. To 2,500 years BC. He was an advisor for several imperial courts in, in ancient China. And he said, after long meditation, that to implement, foreign, uh, to implement state policy in a warlike manner, it's the most counterproductive, barbaric, and inefficient to fight on a battlefield. You know that war is continuation of state policy, right? So if you want successfully to implement your state policy and you start fighting, this is the most idiotic way to do it. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all, but to subvert anything of value in the country of your enemy until such time that the perception of reality of your enemy is screwed up to such an extent that he does not perceive you as an enemy and that your system, your civilization and your ambitions look to your enemy as an alternative, if not desirable, then at least feasible, better red than dead. That's the ultimate purpose the final stage of subversion, after which you can simply take your enemy without a single shot being fired. 
if the subversion is successful. This is basically what subversion is. As you see, not a single mentioning of blowing up bridges. Of course, Sun Tzu did know about blowing up bridges. Maybe there were not that many bridges at that time. <laughs> but the basics of subversion is being taught to every student of KGB school in USSR and to officers of, of military academies. I'm not sure if the same author is included in the list of reading for American officers to say nothing about ordinary students of political science. I had difficulty to find the translation of Sun Tzu in, in the library of of a university in Toronto and later on here in, in Los Angeles. But it's a, it's a book which is not available. It is forced to every student in USSR. Every student who is, who is taught to be dealing further in, in, in his future career with foreigners. What subversion is? Basically, it consists of four periods, time-wise. If we start from here, and go this way, time, right? This is the beginning point. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called, basically, demoralization. It says for itself what it is. It takes from, uh, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. Why? by 15 or 20 years. This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation, one lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. No more, no less. Usually, it takes from 15 to 20 years. What it includes? It includes influencing or by various methods, infiltration, uh, propaganda methods, direct contacts, doesn't really matter. I will describe them later. <laughs> of various areas where public opinion is formulated or shaped, religion, educational system, social life, administration, law enforcement system, military, of course, and labor and employer relations, economy, okay? Five areas. Uh, I will not write them down because we'll not have enough space. Some, sometimes when I describe all the methods, uh, students ask me question, are you sure this is the result of the Soviet influence? Not necessarily. You see, the tactic of subversion about which I'm talking is similar to the martial art, the Japanese martial art. If, you're, if some of you are familiar with that tactic, probably you will remember that if an enemy is bigger and heavier than yourself, it would be very painful to resist his direct strike. If a heavier person wants to strike me in the face, it would be very naive and counterproductive to stop his blow. The Chinese and Japanese judo art tells us what to do. First to avoid the strike, then to grab the fist and continue his movement in the direction where it was before, right? Until the enemy crashes in the wall. You see? So, what happens here? The target country obviously does something wrong. If it's a free democratic society, there are many different movements within the society. There are obviously, in every society, there are people who are against this society. They may be simple criminals, ideologically in disagreement with the, with the state policy conscientious enemies, simply psychotic personalities who are against anything, right? And finally, there are a small group of agents of a foreign nation, bought, subverted, recruited, right? The moment all these movements will be directed in one direction, right? 
This is the time to catch that movement and to continue it until the movement forces the whole society into collapse, into crisis, right? So that's exactly the martial art tactic. We don't stop an enemy. We let him go. We help him to go in the direction we want them to go. Okay? So, on the stage of demoralization, obviously there are tendencies in each society, in each country, which are going to opposite direction from the basic moral values and principles. To take advantage of these movements, to capitalize on them, is the main purpose of the originator of subversion. So we have religion, we have education, we have uh, social life, we have power structure, we have labor relations, uh, unions, and finally we have law and order. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? These are the areas of application of subversion. What it means exactly, <clears throat> in case of religion, destroy it, ridicule it. Replace it with various sects, cults, which bring people's attention, faith, whether it is naive, primitive, doesn't really matter. As long as the basically accepted religious dogma is being slowly eroded and taken away from the supreme purpose of religion, to keep people in touch with, with the supreme being, that serves the purpose. Therefore, replace it, accept it respected religious organizations with fake organizations. Distract people's attention from the real faith and attract them to various different faiths. Education. Distract them from learning something which is constructive, pragmatic, efficient. Instead of mathematics, physics, foreign languages, chemistry, teach them history of urban warfare, Natural food, uh, <laughs> home economy, your sexuality, anything. As long as it takes you away, okay? Uh, social life. Replace traditionally established institutions and organizations with fake organizations. Take away the initiative from people. Take away the responsibility from naturally established links between individuals, group of individuals, and society at large, and replace them with artificially, bureaucratically controlled bodies. Instead of social life and friendship between neighbors, establish social workers' institutions. The people who are on payroll of whom? Society? No. Bureaucracy. The main concern of social workers is not your family, not you, not social relations between groups of people. The main concern is to get the paycheck from the government. What will be the result of their social work doesn't really matter. They can develop all kinds of concepts to show them, to show to the government and to the people that they're useful. Okay. Away from the natural links. Power structure. Okay. The natural bodies of administration, which are traditionally either elected by, by people at large or appointed by elected leaders of society, are being actively substituted by artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected, never, as a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. One of such groups is media. Who elected them? <laughs> how come, how come they, they, pay, they, they, they have so much power? Almost monopolistic power on your mind. They can rape your mind. But who elected them? How come they, are, they have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for, for the elected by you, President, and, and his administration? Who the hell are they? Uh, Spiro Agnew who was hated by the liberal left, called them a bunch of enfeebled snobs. And that's exactly what they are. They think they know. They don't. The, the level of mediocrity in a big establishment like New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major television network, you don't have to be excellent journalist. 
You have to be exactly a mediocre journalist. That's easier to survive. There's no competition anymore. You have your good, nice income, $100,000 a year. That's it. Whether you are better or worse doesn't really matter anymore. As soon as you're smiling to the camera and do your job. That's it. No more, no more competition. Power structure slowly is eroded by the bodies and groups of people who do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power. And yet they do have power. Okay. Together with that, there is another process. Law enforcement, law and order uh, organization and structure is being eroded. For the last 20, 25 years, you, you, if, if you see old movies and new movies, you can see that in new movies, a policeman, an officer of the United States Army looks dumb, angry, psychotic, paranoid. A criminal looks nice, kind of, well, he smokes hash and, and shoots the uh, whatever drug. But basically, he's a nice human being. He's creative. And he's unproductive only because society oppresses him. Whereby a general of Pentagon is always, by definition, a dumb, a war maniac. A policeman is a pig, rude policeman. He abuses his power. No? A generality, generalization like that. The hatred, the mistrust to the people who are supposed to protect you and enforce law and order. Moral relativity. The Angela Buona process lasted two years in Los Angeles. And yet there are still some lawyers who say, look, he's a nice character, as a matter of fact. There was some witness who said, also a criminal, who said, well, he's a nice guy. I asked him one day to burn a house of my enemy, and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> he's a nice fellow. A rosary. A slow substitution of basic moral principles, <coughs> whereby a criminal is not a criminal, actually. He's a defendant, even if his guilt is proven. There is still a doubt to kill or not to kill, to be or not to be. Thy shall not kill, yes. But this uh, line may not necessarily be applicable to a murderer. Thy shall not murder, that should be the, the, the presumption, not, not that thy shall not kill. Okay, labor relations. At this stage, within 15 to 20 years, we destroy the traditionally established links of bargaining between employer and employee. The classical Marxist-Leninist uh, theory of natural exchange of goods. Uh, person A has five sacks of grain and person B has five pairs of shoes. And the natural exchange without money is when they bargain between each other. And only with the introduction of the third force C, uh, an entirely third foreign stranger who says, no, don't give him five sacks of grain, give it to me. And you give me your five pairs of shoes and I will distribute it accordingly. So that the economy will go. This is the death of natural exchange, the death of natural bargaining. Well, trade unions were established 100 years ago. The objective was to improve working conditions and to protect the rights of workers from those employers who were abusing their, their right because they had more money. Objectively, at that time, initially, the trade union movement did work. What we see now is that the bargaining pro process is no longer resulting into a, in the compromise, which is leading objectively to betterment of working conditions and increase of salary. What we see is that after each prolonged strike, the workers lose. Even if they have 10% increase of their salaries, they cannot catch up due to inflation and due to missed time. More than that, Millions of people suffer from that strike because economy now is interdependent. It's intertwined like one body. If previously uh, steel workers, say 100 years ago, could strike and nobody would suffer, now it's impossible anymore. If a garbage collector strikes today, 
the rest of the multi-million city is stinking. I mean, the, the, there's no more service. Uh, in Quebec, for example, we had the electricians who were on strike in the middle of winter. You can freeze your bottom, and they still were on strike. Did they catch up with the salary? No, they lost. Who benefited? The leaders of trade union. What is the motivation for strike? Improving, improving a, wor a, a worker's condition? No, obviously it's not. Then what is it? Ideology. To prove to these capitalists. And the obedient horde of workers, like sheep, follow these people. And they cannot disobey. Why? Because if they do, you know what happens to them. Pickets, murders, shooting truck drivers by picketers. In Montreal, for example, I saw with my own eyes, when I was correspondent of CBC International, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, when the workers of aircraft factory destroyed computers and, and, and the equipment in the factory, and they, the, the administration employed strike breakers, their cars were turned upside down and burned. Their houses were burned, their kids were intimidated, and some victims were there. Of that you can be sure. Why? To improve conditions of worker? No. Ideology. Okay, so this is what happens, basically. It may or may not happen without the help of the Soviet Union. But the natural tendencies are being greatly taken advantage of and capitalized by the Soviet propaganda systems. How? Whenever trade union strikes, we have influx of propaganda, mass media, ideological dissemination, the workers' right, and we repeat it like parrots. Yes, workers' right. Whose rights? Workers? No. The, the only freedom of worker to sell his labor according to his own desire and will is taken away from him. By whom? By trade union boss. Unlimited power is given. Responsibility. I want to sell my labor not for two fifty an hour, but for two dollars. I don't have right. My freedom is denied to me. I know that if I sell my work for two for two dollars an hour, not for three dollars an hour, I will compete better with the, with the other guy who is lazy and more greedy. I don't need two three dollars. I need only two dollars. No, I was made to believe by media, by business, by advertising agencies that I need more and more and more. Have you ever heard any advertising on TV to consume less? No. <laughs> no way. Whether you need a, a, a six-cylinder car or not, you have to buy it. And hurry up. <laughs> when I was driving here on the local radio station, an excited announcer said, you hurry up, rush and save, save, save. There is a pantyhose sale. <laughs> save by buying more. See? <laughs> of course, of course. It, it would be too naive to expect that KGB makes that advertising agency to, to do such a crazy commercial. No, of course not. But what we did when I was working for Novosti Press, we would snow plow editorial offices, student organizations, religious groups with literature of class struggle, May, if, if not directly Marxism, Leninist propaganda. Then a propaganda of of the legitimate aspirations of working class, betterment of life, equality, equality, mind you. President Kennedy once said, people, we will make America to believe that people are born equal. Are people born equal? Is there any mentioning in the Bible or any other holy scripture in any religion, any religion, if you don't believe me, go to the library and check it. There is not a single word about equality. Just the opposite. By your deeds, God will judge you. What you do is important. The merit of your personality. You cannot legislate equality if you want to be equal. You have to be equal. You have to deserve it. And yet, we build our society on the principle of equality. We say people are equal. We know it is false. It's a lie. Some people are tall and stupid. Others are short, bold, and clever.
if we make them. <laughs> If we make them equal by force, <laughs> if we put the principle of equality in the basis of our social political structure, it's the same thing as building a house on sand. Sooner or later, it will collapse, and that's exactly what happens. And we, as Soviet propaganda makers, are trying to push you in the direction which you go yourself. Equality, yes, equality. People are equal. Land of equal opportunities. Is it true or not? Think about it. Equal opportunities. Should there be equal opportunities? For me, and for a lazy bastard who come here from some other country and immediately registers as, as a welfare <laughs> uh, recipient benefits. I never received a single dot. No, sorry, I did receive once. But I never applied for welfare. For the 13 years, I took any job. Security guard, journalist, taxi driver, anything. Well, I was restless. But some people don't like it. They immediately... So why should we, be e why should we have equal opportunities? Why? The equal o opportunity to excel. Equal opportunity in equal circumstances, yes, but we know people are different. To excel, yes, provided we reach the same level of excellency, perfection, which is hypothetical distant future. Yes, maybe, but we know perfectly well that even with the best intentions, people could not be equal. Why should we have equality in, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, say, legal system? Myself, I'm, I'm considering myself a law-abiding citizen, and a person who comes here to rob and shoot, say, the, the, the United States administration under Carter imported thousands of Cuban criminals. They were non-criminals, yet they were accepted. Do you think it's fair if myself and my wife from Philippines who work like a, excuse me, horse, uh, as a lab technician in, in the hospital, should have the same rights as a criminal from, from Cuba? Why? And yet we repeat as parrots, equality, equality, equality. And the Soviet propaganda system helps us to believe that equality is something which is desirable. Democracy, as it was established by fathers of this country, of, of this system, in the last century, is, is not equality. Is the system where different people, unequal people, have a chance to survive and help each other in constant competition, in constant perfection, not in equality, which is superimposed from, from a, a, a godfather or a nice person in Washington, D.C. And the absolute equality exists in Soviet Union, quote-unquote equality. Everybody is equal in, in dirt. Except some people are more equal than the others in Politburo. <laughs> <laughs> so, the moment you, you bring a country to the point of almost total demoralization, when nothing works anymore, when you are not sure whether it is right or, or wrong, good and bad, where there's no division between evil and good, when even the Leaders of church sometimes say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice, is justified in a countries like Nicaragua, El Salvador, well, maybe Rhodesia. And we listen to them and say, yeah, probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist-Leninism, that is my former colleagues from Novos to Press Agency. Okay, so we reach that point. The next step is destabilization. Again, this word says for itself what it is. To destabilize all the relations, all the accepted institutions and organizations in a country of your enemy. How you do it? You don't have to send up a battalion of KGB agents to blow up bridges, no. You let them do it themselves. The area of application is, again, it's, it's, it's narrower now. Not like the, the previous case. The overt legitimate actions 
of the, of the KGB in this case would be ha hardly noticeable. There is no crime if a professor who recently went to USSR introduces a course of Marxism-Leninism in, in a, a, a Californian college, for example. Nobody is going to, to come to his doorstep and say, okay, mister, come, you are under arrest. No, it's not a crime. It's not even considered a moral crime against your country. So the area of application here is narrowing down to ec economy, again, labor relations, right? To law and order, plus military. And uh, economy, law and order. Yes, and again, the uh, media, but uh, wider scope, a little bit different. I'll explain it later. Okay, basically, three areas. Economy. The radicalization of bargaining process. If on that stage we still could achieve, theoretically, some positive compromise between the negotiating sides with, with uh, say, uh, the ar ar arbitrary, in introduction of arbitrary judges, uh, third side, uh, objectively judging the, the demands of both sides. Here, it's radicalization. On, this, on the stage of destabilization, we cannot come to compromise even within a family. The husband and wife couldn't figure out which is better. Husband wants his kids to eat at the table, and wife wants him, a child, to roam around the room and, and drop food all over the floor. They cannot <laughs> come to compromise unless they start a fight. It's impossible to reach a compromise, constructive compromise, between neighbors. Some people say, I don't like you to watering your lawn at that time because exactly at that time I'm walking my dog and he's getting nervous. So he cannot uh, pass his bowels, you know. So they cannot compromise. They go to a, a, a civil court or something like that. Radicalization of human relations. No more compromise. Fight, fight, fight. The normal, traditionally accepted relations are destabilized. The relations between teachers and students in schools and colleges fight. The, the relations between, in economical sphere between laborers and, and employers are further uh, radicalized. No more acceptance of the legitimacy of demands of workers. Unlike Japanese, with the theory Z, if you, if you ever heard about it, where the workers are involved in the decision-making process. Therefore, they don't have uh, moral incentive to, to fight their, uh, their bosses. In the United States, it's just the opposite. The harder is the, the fight, the better. The more heroic they look. When the Greyhound uh, network was on strike recently, the correspondents of local TV networks uh, all over the United States were approaching the strikers and they say, oh yes, we are doing something nice. They look like heroes and they were proud. There was some family, uh, the husband was a uh, bus driver. Now they decided in, 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 in the protest against the uh, uh, bosses to camp somewhere in the forest. And they were presented to the, to the audience as, as a heroic, nice people, you see. The violent clashes between passengers, picketers, and, and the strikers are presented as something normal. 10, 15, 20 years ago, we would, we would, be, uh, we would be angry, say, why, why, why so much hatred? Today we are not. We say, well, it's commonplace. Radicalization, militarization sometimes. As I explained uh, uh, on that stage, I, I took a step a little bit further. Shooting people. Okay. Law and order now also is uh, pushed into the area where previously people settled their differences uh, peacefully and legitimately. Now we are getting with this uh, uh, court cases in the, in the smallest irrelevant cases. We cannot solve our problems anymore. The society at large becomes more and more antagonistic between individuals, between groups of individuals, and the society at large. The media 
puts himself in the opposition to the society in general, at large, separate, alienated. Okay? On that stage, you remember I was talking uh, a, a couple of hours ago about the sleepers. That's when the students from, say, United States, if they are trained in, in Lumumba University, or developing nations, that's the students I was dealing with, are being sent back from the Soviet Union here. Or if they were already in the United States, in the country, which is the object of, of subversion, they spring to action. The sleepers go up. They slept for 15 to 20 years. Now they become leaders of groups, preachers, uh, I don't know, public, public figures. Prominently they act. In, they actively include themselves in a political process. All of a sudden we see a homosexual. 15 years ago he did his dirty job and nobody cared. Now he makes it a political issue. He demands recognition, respect, human rights, and he rallies a ra large group of people. And there are violent clashes between him and police, his group and, and ordinary people, no matter what. It's black against white, yellows against green, doesn't matter where the division line goes. As long as this group come into antagonistic clash, sometimes militantly, sometimes with firearms. That is destabilization process. The sleepers, many of whom are simply KGB agents, become leaders of the process of destabilization. Doesn't mean that Comrade Andropov sends Comrade Ivanov to the United States. The person who takes care is already here. He is a respected citizen of the United States. Sometimes he, he gets money from various foundations for, for his legitimate uh, struggle for, I don't know, human rights, women rights, kid lib, prison lib, whatever. There are sympathetic Americans who donate their money to him. This stabilization process usually leads directly to the process of crisis. In case of developing nations, that's the area where I, I was active. The process starts when, when the legitimate bodies of power, the social structure collapse. It's, it cannot function anymore. So instead, we have artificial body injected into society, such as non-elected committees. You remember I was talking about them here. Social workers who are not elected by people, media who, self, who are self-appointed rulers of your opinion, uh, some strange groups uh, which claim that they know how to lead society forward. They don't usually. All they care is how to collect the nations and, and, prom and sell their own concocted ideology, mixture of religion and ideology. Here, we have all this artificial body claiming power. If the power is denied to them, they take it by force. In case of Iran, for example, all of a sudden we have revolutionary committees. Who? What, what kind of revolution? There was no revolution yet, and yet they had the committees. They were taking power of, of judgment. They had, they had the power of execution, they had the power of, of uh, le legislation, and that they had the power of, of uh, judicial. Uh, all of them combined in one person, who is half-baked intellectual, sometimes graduated from Harvard University or, or Berkeley. He comes back to his country and, and he, he thinks that he, he knows the answer to all the social economical problems. Okay? Crisis is when society cannot function any more productively. It collapses, obviously. That's the, the word for crisis. So therefore, the population at large is looking for a savior. The religious groups are expecting a messiah to come. The workers say, we have family to feed. Let's have a strong government, maybe socialist government, centralized. When, when somebody put, put the employers on their place and, and let us work, we are sick and tired of going to strike and, and missing overtime and all that stuff. We need some strong man, strong government, a leader 
A savior is needed. Population is sick and tired already. And here we are. We have a savior. Either a foreign nation comes in, or the local group of, of leftists, Marxists, no matter what they call themselves, Sandinista, a reverend or some sort, Bishop Muzureva, like in, in Zimbabwe, doesn't matter. A savior comes and says, I will lead you. So we have two alternatives here. Civil war and invasion. Okay? See how it goes? Civil war, we know what it is. Lebanon is, is the best example. The civil war, which was artificially implanted in Lebanon by injection of force of PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. Invasion we have in many other countries like Afghanistan, uh, name any East European country, it, it was invaded by the Soviet army. But the result is the same. The next stage is normalization. Normalization is a very ironic word, of course. It is borrowed from 1968 situation in Czechoslovakia, when the Soviet propaganda and after them New York Times declared the country is normalized. The tanks moved into Prague, so there is no more Prague Spring, there is no more violence, normal, normalization. At that stage, the self-appointed rulers of the society don't need any revolution anymore. They don't need any radicalism anymore. So, this is the reverse from destabilization. Basically, it is stabilizing the country by force. So, all the sleepers and activists and social workers and liberals and homosexuals and professors and Marxists and Leninists are being eliminated physically sometimes. They've done their job already. Okay? They are not needed anymore. The new rulers need stability to exploit the nation, to exploit the country, to take advantages of the victory. Okay? So no more revolutionaries, please. And that's exactly what happens in a number of countries. You remember Bangladesh? This is the crisis in which I was instrumental. First they had Mujibur Rahman. In 1971 he was the leader of, of People's Party, Avani League, with moustache like Stalin. He was in, in, in Russia many times. In five years, he was shot by his former colleagues, Marxists. He fulfilled his function. In Afghanistan, it happened three times. First there was Taraki, then there was Amin, now there is Babrak Karmal. They killed each other successively, one after another. The moment he fulfilled his duty, the first one demoralized country, the second destabilized, the third one brought it to crisis. Goodbye, comrades. <laughs> Babrak Karmal comes from Moscow and put him in, in, into the seat of power. Same thing happened in Grenada recently. Maurice Bishop, Marxist, was killed by Austin, what's his name, General something, who was also a Marxist. Right? So no more revolutions, please. Normalization now. From now on, no more strikes, no more homosexuals, no more women lib, no more kid lib, no more lib, period. <laughs> a good, solid, democratic, proletarian freedom. <laughs> now, to reverse this process takes enormous effort. When today, United States had to invade Grenada to reverse the process of subversion. Some people say, boy, this is not good, it's not kosher to invade the beautiful country, island of Grenada. <laughs> well, why didn't you stop the process here, when Grenada was just approached by leftists? Why not to prevent Maurice Bishop to come in power in the first place? Did Grenadians want him? Very questionable. They didn't know who was Maurice Bishop in the first place. He came to power by coup d'etat himself. Okay? No, we let the situation develop further and further and further, until the crisis and normalization very soon 
And then the United States decided to invade country, discovering that the, the country was absolutely a military base for the Soviet Union. Of course, it's a drastic measure. Of course, it's, it's a pity that uh, Marine Corps had to, to lose, what, 17 lives. Very bad. Why not to stop the process before it comes to crisis? Oh, no, intellectuals will not let you. It's interference in the, into domestic affairs. They are very careful not to, not, not to let American administration to interfere in domestic affairs of Latin American countries. They don't mind Soviet Union interfering in these affairs. Okay. So to reverse this process, from here, it takes only and always military force. No other force on earth can reverse this process at this point. At this point, it does not take military invasion of the United States Army. It takes strong action, like in Chile, a CIA covert involvement to prevent the savior from outside to come into power and to stabilize country before it erupts into civil war. Okay? Support the right-wing conservative forces. Buy money, buy crooks or love, doesn't matter. Stabilize the country. Don't let the crisis develop into, into civil war or invasion. Oh, no, your liberals will say it's, it's against the law. The Congress will not appropriate money for covert actions of CIA. Why not? Should we wait till the normalization come and Soviet tanks land in, in, in Los Angeles airport? Now, at that point, at the point of destabilization, also the process could be reversed. Again, easily than this. No CIA involvement at this point. You know what it takes here? Restriction of some liberties for small groups which are self-declared enemies of the society. As simple as that. Oh no, the media and liberals will tell you this is against the American Constitution. How can we, uh, by force, deny the civil rights to criminals, for example? It's, it's not good. Okay? So we allow them to... Okay, if you allow the criminals to have civil rights, Go on and bring the country to the crisis. This is a bloodless way to do. Curb the rights. I mean, not to put them in prison. No, no, I'm not talking about putting all the gays from San Francisco in the concentration camp. Do not allow them <laughs> to take political force. Do not elect them to the seats of power, whether it is municipality level, state level, or federal level. It has to be beaten in the heads of American voters, that a person like that, in the seats of power, is an enemy. Do not be afraid of this word. It is an enemy. If he is not an enemy here, he will be here. Later on, he will be shot, of course. <laughs> but at this point, he is an enemy. Okay? You are doing great service by denying him a right to capitalize on his own crazy ideas and become a powerful man, a, a man who uses the seat of power. Restriction of certain freedoms and permissiveness at that point would prevent sliding into crisis and probably will return the process of destabilization. To curb unlimited power, monopolistic power of trade unions here at that point would save economy from collapsing. To introduce a law to stop private companies of raping public opinion's mind in, con in, the, in the direction of consumerism. No company must have a right to force you into buying more unless you want it. There must be a law. You want to advertise your, your car? Okay. But not a single mentioning of Buying it now and saving money. <laughs> <laughs> it must be against the law to force people to consume more. Self-restraint. Previously, before this process started, the self-restraint was a business of church, religion. Because our preachers, the fathers of church, would tell us, material values are good, but it's not the prime function of human being, because you have to live with something, obviously, the design for our life is not to consume more deodorants, 
There must be something greater. If such a complicated instrument as human body was created, obviously there must be some higher purpose for that. And it's very easy to avoid destabilization by denying the greedy companies one little freedom, one little liberty, forcing you into turning yourself into processors of unwanted pr products and goods. They turn you into machines, like a, 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 the worm who there's inlet and outlet. So, and how long a, a, an average appliance lasts these days? Less than a year. Why? Where's workmanship? Oh, we want you to buy more. Okay. Destabilization process could be easily overcome if, as I say, the society, by its own will or after persuasion by the leaders, will come <coughs> to the idea of self-restraint. It's so hard we want to consume more, but you have to. Unless you will come to this stage, when, as we say in Russia, if Sahara Desert ever becomes a communist state, there will be shortage of sand. <laughs> so you have to curb your... <laughs> you, have to, you have to curb your expectations at this point before it's too late. But no, we don't want to do it. Demoralization process. Again, it's the easiest thing to reverse. First of all, by restricting import of propaganda. The easiest thing to do, unlimited, unrestrained import of Soviet literature, Soviet journalists, uh, giving Soviet propaganda and ideological agitators equal time on American TV network. It has to be stopped. And it's easier. They won't, they won't be offended, mind you. As a matter of fact, they will respect America more. But when my former colleague Vladimir Posner appears on Nightline and Ted Koppel asks him, well, Vladimir, what do you think about this? And what can he think? He is an instrument of propaganda. He thinks what, what, what Comrade Andropov tells him to think. <laughs> He's just a nice, articulate mouthpiece of the Soviet uh, uh, subversion system. And Ted Koppel makes you believe that my friend Vladimir Posner thinks... <laughs> <laughs> the process of demoralization may not have started at all if at that point the country, which is a recipient of subversion, actively, not violently, but actively, prevents importation of foreign ideology. I don't want America to follow the pattern of ancient Japan. You don't have to shoot every foreigner when it approaches the sacred borders of the United States. But when he offers you a junk in the disguise of very shiny something, you have to tell him, no, we have our own junk. <laughs> <laughs> if at that point the society is strong, brave, and conscientious enough to stop importation of ideas which are foreign, then the whole chain of events could be prevented. Recently I've been to the Philippines and I was shocked how in big cities like Manila, children listen to deafening music. A melodious nation with long traditions of, of good, nice ethnic music introduced by Spanish long time ago, maybe two centuries, three centuries ago, I don't remember how long. All of a sudden, listen to musical garbage, blasting their radios at, at full blast, at the full volume. Why? In India, I spent many years watching the reactions of Indians walking out of movie theaters after seeing Hollywood production, they, they couldn't figure out why Americans are so wasteful. They smash their cars, their shiny cars, every five minutes. How come they shoot each other for half million dollars? 
Is it true that they are so sex, sex uh, uh, I mean, obsessed with sex? Can you imagine showing a movie where each five minutes there is a copulation on the screen to a country like India with long traditions, tradition of, of uh, respect to, to these private matters? Or to Pakistan? And United States expect these people to respect you? No way. Oh, yes, they will see the movie. They'll pay five rupees to see that garbage. But they walk out and will tell their kids, don't respect Americans. Don't be like Americans. See? So, the process of demoralization could be stopped right here, both as an expert and as an import. And that takes one step, one very important thing to do. You don't have to expel all the KGB agents from Washington, D.C. The most difficult and at the same time the simplest answer to the subversion is to start it here and even before. By bringing back the society to religion. Something that you cannot touch and eat and put on yourself. But something that rules society and makes it move and preserve it. A Soviet scientist, Shafarevich, who has nothing to do with religion, he is a computer scientist, did a very intensive research <clears throat> on the history of socialist countries. He calls socialist or communist <clears throat> any country with a centralized economy and a pyramidal style of power structure. And he discovered, actually he didn't discover it, he just brought to attention of, of his readers, that civilizations like Mohenjo-Daro, in the river Hindus area, like Egypt, like Maya, Incas, like Babylo ba Babylonian culture, collapsed and disappeared from the surface of Earth. The moment they lost religion, as simple as that, they disintegrated. Nobody remembers about them anymore. Well, distantly. <clears throat> so, the ideas are moving society and keeping mankind as a as, as society of human beings, intelligent, moral agents of God. The facts, the truth, the exact knowledge may not. All the sophisticated technology and computers will not prevent society from disintegrating and eventually dying out. Have you ever met a person who would sacrifice his life, freedom, for the truth like that. This is truth. I never met a person who said, this is truth and I'm ready to shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> to defend the truth. Right? But millions sacrifice their life, freedom, comfort, everything for things like God. Like Jesus Christ. It's an honor. Some martyrs in, in the Soviet concentration camp died. And they died in peace. Unlike those who shouted, long live Stalin. Knowing perfectly well that he may not live long. <laughs> something which is... Something which is not material. Moves society and helps it to survive. And the other way around, the moment we turn into 2 by 2 is 4 and make it a guiding principle of our life, our existence, we die. Even though this is true and this we cannot prove, we only can feel and have faith in it. So the answer to ideological subversion, strangely enough, is very simple. You don't have to shoot people, you don't have to aim mi missiles and Pershings and cruise missiles at Andropov's headquarters. You simply have to have faith and prevent subversion. In other words, not to be a victim of subversion. Don't try to be a person who in Zudo is trying to smash your enemy and being caught by your hand. Don't strike like that. Strike with the power of your spirit and moral superiority. 
If you don't have that power, it's high time to develop it. And that's the only answer. That's it. Thank you. Can you describe how a concept is formulated, turned into propaganda, and then ends up on someone's bumper sticker or in a newspaper? What's the step-by-step -step process? The other thing is, how close is the Politburo to the actual propaganda creating process? Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, the 007 incident was uh, notable in the fact that it took a long time before the Soviets responded to it, and then the military took the lead in terms of explaining what had happened rather than the uh, political organs and I wanted to know why that actually happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the propaganda concepts are not being developed. They, they had been developed long time ago. There's nothing basically new in the concept of, of overall propaganda uh, methods and goals. The ultimate goal, however ridiculous it may sound, or primitive or simplistic, is the world domination. Many uh, uh, Many experts in foreign policy would ridicule my opinion, but this is what it is. I saw it with my own eyes. I was a part of that. So, and my father was, I think I mentioned that before, he was an inspector of land forces. He traveled all over the world where the Soviet troops were stationed. So he knows perfectly well that the troops are not stationed there to collect harvest for Cubans or, or to help Afghanis to, to uh, develop the... Uh, what the Hordes of cattle or goats, they are there for one purpose, world domination. The concepts, the immediate issues or problems are created, of course, for propaganda purposes, and they end up uh, as a bumper s stickers, probably not uh, long, uh, it takes really short period of time. Unlike some other things in, in the Soviet system, uh, propaganda takes propaganda is one of the things that they don't save money on and um, there is a, a huge apparatus of propaganda experts in USSR Novosti Press Agency is just one of them one of the organizations but apart from them that there is a department of agitation and propaganda with this within the central committee there are faceless people names of whom you will never learn uh, they are kind of classified. Uh, I didn't explain you the methods today because it will take us another day. The methods include such things as semantic manipulation. The words and expressions are being coined at the rate of five expressions a minute by extremely clever, educated experts. And the media outside of USSR obediently repeats this cliché. I give you just several examples, not, not to take your time, not to bore you to death. Okay, I mentioned one thing, United Nations. The expression was invented by the Soviet propaganda experts, not by Americans. We know perfectly well it's not united and it has nothing to do with nations. More than half of the delegations in the UN do not represent any nation at all. Uh, they are disunited, obviously. Uh, the United Nations had not been able to solve a single military conflict. Nowhere in the world. Uh, they provoked war, yes, they took part in wars, but they didn't prevent expansion of communism or, or they did not prevent a single war anywhere. So the true expression, the true term for United Nations could be disunited bureaucracies. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, another cliché which was coined in Moscow by experts of propaganda. National Liberation Movement. It's not national because most of the leaders do, do not necessarily belong to the ethnic group which they lead, number one. Number two, they are unpatriotic and unnationalistic because they, they obey orders from a foreign country, USSR. 
Okay? They are trained in USSR, they are paid by the Soviet system, and they, they work in the interests of the Soviet system. Liberation. Whom they are liberating? Who is being liberated? And movement. Movement, we understand, there's something which moves, unlike uh, something which is static. National liberation does not move. It's a war. If, if, you, if you call war a movement, probably. But it, it has nothing to do with uh, the concept of movement in, in American terminology. It means a legitimate, overt, organized, voluntary uh, movement. Right? I presume your, your church or your organization is voluntary. Nobody keeps you here by force. Okay, National Liberation Movement is an army of bandits, professional bandits, which are kept, kept in, within the framework of the movement by force. If they betray, it's like in mafia, they are going to be executed. Okay, another example <coughs> of semantic manipulation is, uh, mm, okay, mm, free medical aid, for example. You think it's it's an American democratic expression? No way. The, this the, the term was coined by by the communists long time ago at the time of Comintern. There is nothing free in this world. Everybody knows it. Least of all medical aid. It's very expensive thing to render medical assistance to other people. To somebody, sometime, somewhere has to pay for it. Who? Taxpayer. Hmm? Obviously. There are many other things that are being coined by, by the Soviet propaganda apparatus. Unfortunately, see, if, if I call myself a genius, a genius writer, for example, Los Angeles Times would not call me that, right? They will call me a strange, crazy Russian who calls himself a genius. Then why the hell they call liberation movements uh, liber what, what, what they call themselves? Just because they are many? The logic is twisted. Um, the stickers on, on, on the bumpers, I don't know. It, it, it depends on the uh, ability of local forces to, to uh, tow up the, uh, tow the foreign policy. How close is Politburo to, to implementation of propaganda actions? Very distant. See, Politburo is a group of self-imposed dictators. They don't really decide anything. The only uh, objective of their existence and their life and their struggle is to stay in power. Unlike American politician who has two objectives. First, to be elected, and second, to be re-elected. <laughs> the, so the, so the Soviet politician doesn't have the first objective. He does not have to be elected. He just makes his way in the party structure all the way up. The election doesn't bother him at all. So the only purpose of his life is to stay where he is and don't rock the boat. They don't make decisions. The decision-making level are the faceless group of experts, as I, as I tried to explain to you. And they, the, the Politburo gives only the basic directions, what to be done, and the obedient servants of the highest caliber, intellectuals, are dutifully developing these things. Um, some independently thinking progressive academics in the United States think that come socialism they will be able to preserve their integrity and independence. It's wishful thinking. They will become obedient servants of the system that they are trying to force upon you. Uh, the Korean airliner incident, from my viewpoint, is not an incident at all. I believe it's, it's, a, it's a carefully planned and premeditated provocation. I'm not sure whether they did it, they killed two, 268 people just to get rid of Larry McDonald, but it, it's feasible. I wouldn't be surprised if they killed uh, more than 60 millions of their own men just to implement rotten ideas of, of Marx and Engels. You know, what, what, what would 268 people matter? Uh, uh, second, it, it is not a military blunder, and, and it, the order was not given by military. Never a single military officer of the highest caliber will take responsibility to shoot a civilian airliner. My father was an officer of general staff of the Soviet Army. I know perfectly well what I'm talking about. 
No officer would take responsibility. He'll be shot tomorrow. Are you kidding? It's, the order was given by a civilian, by party apparatchik of the highest caliber, and I wouldn't be surprised it was Andropov. In any case, Andropov knew perfectly well what goes on, what, goes on, what went on. The Soviet power structure resembles a triangle, unlike a love triangle in, in real life drama. It's a hate triangle. The, the seats of power are <coughs> party, communist party, the elite, of course, not the rank and file party, but the top of the pyramid, the KGB and the military. They hate each other, and each of them hate the other two. The, the <laughs> The most powerful is the party. This is the real power. The army and the KGB supposedly are servants of the party and the tools, the instruments of their power. But in fact, sometimes they are the power themselves. Andropov belongs to the most hated triangle, the KGB. My father hated KGB because he was military. Both of them, KGB and military, hate the party. Why? Because unlike in the United States, the party is the most adventuristic people. They want to invade countries. They give the orders for all kinds of adventures outside of USSR borders. They know perfectly well that comes war, they will go to bunkers and eat caviar and enjoy life, whereby military will burn in flames of nuclear war. Marshal Grechko was against invasion into Czechoslovakia because he knew that he will have to demoralize his army. And the first two divisions, after facing the reality and seeing that Czechoslovakia is not being invaded by Americans, will get corrupted. So you have to replace them with other two divisions. And if you stay long enough, you will corrupt the whole Soviet army. He said, no, don't invade Czechoslovakia. But Comrade Brezhnev said, who the hell they are? They think they, they deserve more sausages and butter. So show them thanks. So he did, he obeyed. Uh, the, the, the KGB... The, the KGB and the army sometimes are in cahoots against the party. The recent rumor that Andropov was shot by son of Brezhnev is an indication that the, the other two corners of the power structure were really sick and tired of, of, the, of the Andropov's KGB purges. You know, there were purges. They, they, many people lost their jobs and some were arrested and some committed suicide in the span of some 10 uh, uh, 10 months since Andropov was sentenced to power. So that gives you an idea of well, the Korean airliner incident is premeditated provocation to create an international tension because the only power on earth which is interested in provoking conflicts and preserving tension is the Soviet junta. That's the only justification of them being in power. If there is no enemy outside, they have to create him. If there is no war, they have to provoke it to scare the hell out, out of taxpayers inside and to keep themselves in power. There are so many theories. Uh, one of them is expressed by, I wouldn't say a friend of mine, but I know him. There's another defector, Nikolai Khochlov who defected long time before I even joined KGB. Uh, he was also a KGB in, in Western Europe. Now he is, teaches psychology in, in one of California universities. He thinks that the Soviet Union developed an ESP, would you believe it, system of influencing the perception and minds of people. And the, the generators of ESP willpower can be focused on individuals and groups of individuals so efficiently that you can literally focus that beam or whatever it is on a pilot or two pilots or three pilots and convince them that actually they are flying on the safe territory so there is no need, they, you can convince them that there is no need to, to contact the, the, the ground base station and you can artificially draw the plane by brainwave into the Soviet airspace. Whether it is true or not, I don't know. But I know one thing, that when I was a student and I graduated from Oriental Studies Institute, one of my friends, he was an extremely intelligent Jewish boy, he graduated from the mathematical uh, department of Moscow State University. After three years, 
I returned from India for, for vacation, and I met him in the um, on uh, during the reception at the Academy of Science. And I said, "What are you doing here?" He said, "I'm working in the secret research bureau. You know, the secret, which means basically defense uh, industry. They don't have addresses; they have post box numbers." And I say, it's not, is it that much secret that you cannot tell me what you research? He said, you wouldn't believe me? Brain waves. And I never saw him again. <laughs> uh, ESP, which officially in the Soviet media is uh, described as a pseudoscience and decadent capitalist gimmick to sidetrack the minds of proletariat from the real issues of class struggle. But obviously KGB takes seriously that uh, pseudoscience. Okay.